let's recap where we're up to in the course and what the relevant reading in the textbook is. We've done a load of information theory, data compression, and statistical channel coding. We're now into the inference and data modeling part of the course. The relevant chapters are shown here. Chapters 20 and 22 on clustering and stuff. Monte Carlo methods, chapters 29, 30, and 32. Variational methods coming up in the next lecture, chapter 33. I'd like to highlight some additional reading which covers material we won't do in lectures, but it's a good thing to do as part of the course. I encourage you to read a very short chapter called Laplace's Method, chapter 27. And in order to understand this lecture and the next one fully, you may want to read about icing models in chapter 31 if you're not already familiar with them. There's also a whole bunch of recommended exercises on the website, and some of, some of them are on the screen now. Uh, you may enjoy doing those. I certainly think if you want to fully understand the material, then doing the exercises is a key part of this course. The course website is there. The book's website is there. And we're in the middle of talking about Monte Carlo methods. In the last lecture, we introduced some basic standard Monte Carlo methods. And the rules of the game are that we are interested in, in a red distribution called P. It's red because it's a bit nasty. It's not utterly nasty. We can compute it. So we can write it as e to the minus e of x on z. And we have got a computer program that can evaluate this thing for any value of x, x being a sort of high dimensional thing whose properties we're interested in under this distribution. So the rules of the game are we can evaluate e, but not z. We don't know z. z would be of interest. We'd like to know that. And we often give up on z because it's so hard to know it. And the problems we're Focusing on our problems one and two. Problem one says, give me some samples x, r that come from p. Problem two says, either by solving problem one or in some other way, please tell me the expected value of some functions I'm interested in under a nasty red distribution. So I want to know the average value of phi, which is some function I'm interested in. And that's the average under the nasty red distribution of the function. And there might be several such functions, phi, that we want to know the average value of. We can use solutions to problem one to answer problem two because we can just say, well, here's an estimator of um, this expected value. We can estimate that uh, by um, summing up by at the random samples that you got from the distribution and looking at the empirical average of phi. So that's a possible way of using problem one to solve problem two. And sometimes today, the nasty red distribution will be the P of a spin system. So one example I mentioned in the last lecture is maybe we're interested in nanomagnets and we have a spin system with an energy E that depends on the couplings J and the energy system the energy of a spin system is a sum of a load of weighted cross terms between pairs of spins. And there may also be local fields H, N at each of the little spins, N, where X here is an n-dimensional binary vector. So that's an example of a problem we might want to solve. The sort of things you might want to know for your nanomagnet are what is its average energy? What's the fluctuations in its energy, which you can get if you know the mean squared energy and the mean energy? What's its mean magnetization, which is the 
average of um, the spins or maybe what mean squared magnetization. And we might be interested in the entropy of it, which is the average of log 1 over p. So those are a bunch of things we might want to know for a nanomagnet. And you probably want to, want to know all of those at a range of temperatures. So we can pop in a parameter beta, like this, that multiplies the energy. And then we've got a normalizing constant that now depends on the inverse temperature. Beta is called the inverse temperature. So those are examples of things you might want to know. And I emphasized last time, when we do Monte Carlo methods, we are not trying to find the most probable state of a system. So we're not trying to minimize E. We would only be implicitly doing that if we set the temperature, uh, the inverse temperature, to a very large value. So we make the system very cold, then it will hopefully be finding its ground state. But that's not the goal of a Monte Carlo method. We're not trying to minimize E. We're interested in sampling from this whole uh, distribution, seeing what a few samples from its typical set look like, and we're not trying to visit the whole of its typical set, because the size of its typical set will easily be bigger than uh, the number of electrons in the universe um, raised to a very large power. Okay, so that's the rules of the game and an example of what we're doing, and last time we discussed important sampling, rejection sampling, Gibb sampling, and the Metropolis method. The Metropolis method is actually a very general catch-all because many of the other methods are examples of the Metropolis method. So when I say the Metropolis method today, I'm quite often using a, a shorthand for a Metropolis method with a simple proposal distribution of the type that I showed in the uh, little show. Let's repeat that little show now just to remind you what we were doing. So we had a nasty probability distribution in red and we have functions whose average values we are interested in. And we looked at simple uh, sampling from a uniform distribution and then reweighting points. We looked at sampling from a different distribution uh, which we could draw samples from, shown in green, the easy distribution skew. Then you reweight the points. So this was called important sampling. You reweight uh, the phi values to take account of having used the wrong distribution. And we did that for a variety of distributions called Q. Then we looked at uh, rejection sampling, which is a way of perfectly sampling from the red distribution by throwing away uh, some of the samples you drew from the green distribution. And rejection sampling uh, doesn't work if you do it wrong. And it's also very difficult to do in high dimensions. But it's often a, a viable technique in small numbers of dimensions, especially one dimension. And there are high dimensional methods, such as Gibbs sampling, which can use rejection sampling as a component to make them go, with the rejection sampling being used in one dimension at a time. Then we got on to the Metropolis method. And my example for the Metropolis method was that we have a continuous space, and the nasty distribution is shown in red. And we introduce a green distribution, which varies with the current state. So whatever your current state is, we plot, for example, a little Gaussian on that current state. And we have a skinny Gaussian whose width isn't necessarily related to properties of the red distribution at all. And it doesn't have to be. Um, so you pick any cue you want. And then there's a rule when you draw from that cue for either accepting or rejecting that, that proposal. And we toddled around. And the rejections lead to points piling up in the places where P is big. So if there weren't any rejections, you'd just be doing a random walk under the green distribution for the sets. But the rejections cause us to end up with samples that actually have to possibly come from the red distribution. And there's a theorem that uh, for almost any green distribution Q, uh, Asymptotically, the Metropolis method will, given sufficiently long running time, give you a sample at time t that comes from the, the red distribution. Uh, however, 
that asymptotic time could be extremely, extremely long if you've made a poor choice of, of Q. So that was the Metropolis method. And I also showed you Gibbs sampling. I won't recap the, the Gibbs demo now. But there's a little picture of it here which involves uh, updating one variable at a time from its conditional distribution. The Gibbs sampling method has the nice property that it doesn't have any parameters in it, unlike the Metropolis method that I showed you, which had to have, you had to pick a skew distribution. It had, you had to choose a set size, a typical width of your skew distribution, and, and that might be quite an important parameter. Gibbs sampling doesn't have any parameters, which is nice. It doesn't mean that Gibbs sampling is fantastic, but at least you don't have to tune it. Okay. What we're going to do now is focus in a bit on these simple methods, especially the Metropolis method that we've just been looking at, and we're going to criticize it uh, so that we are motivated to uh, do the advanced methods. So, here are the problems with the standard Monte Carlo methods, especially the Metropolis method that uh, I described to you so far. First, it gets around by a random walk, and random walks can, can be very slow. I'll go into more detail on that in a moment. Second, the Metropolis method I showed you has got a step size to it, and the results that you get are actually very sensitive to the choice of step size. If you choose a tiny step size, your random walk problems get uh, much worse. If you use too big a step size, then typically you'll get nowhere very slowly. So you have to tune it carefully, and it would be great to have methods that don't need that sort of careful tuning uh, to get good results. Finally, I told you a theorem that says asymptotically this thing will converge, but there's no way of telling with these standard methods, well, have they converged? You can run a whole load of diagnostics, but you really don't get any guarantee of conversion. And we're going to look at solutions of all three of these problems today. We're going to discuss more efficient methods that reduce random walk behavior. We're going to discuss a method called slice sampling that has no tunable parameters, or, well, it does, have, it does still have some tunable parameters, but the, the, the critical sensitivity to those parameters is taken away. And finally, I'll, I'll discuss an amazing thing called exact sampling, which is a method that uh, is effectively runs the chain for an infinite time, even though it only uses a finite amount of computer time. So it knows when to stop because it has run for an infinite time. Brilliant. So let's talk about random walk behavior. And I want to uh, look at a simple a really simple example just to uh, run home um, what the challenge of random walk behavior is. So here we have a little demo which is for the following toy problem. Tub that you liked again. So for the toy world, the red distribution unnormalized is 1 in a bunch of places and 0 in a bunch of others. The x itself lives in the set of all integers. And it's 1 whenever x is in this subset of the set of all integers. 0, 1, 2, 3, dot, 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 20. And it's 0 otherwise. OK, so that's the nasty distribution which, if you're very good at plotting graphs in your head, looks like this. And we're going to pretend that we can't draw directly from that distribution. And to help us, we're going to introduce a simpler distribution that we can draw from because we do have access to a fair coin. And we could toss the fair coin. And we're going to make a proposal to move from the current place x to a new place x prime in this way. It's, we're going to flip the coin, and it's going to come up 50-50. And uh, if it comes up heads, we'll say, let's move left. And if it comes up tails, we'll say, let's move right one unit. So this is an example of a nasty distribution, which if we actually knew how wide this was, we would realize it's roughly 20 Y, so capital L is going to be my name for the long length scale of a distribution. And the steps that we're, we're taking here 
I'll call set of size 1. So I'm giving a name to my set size parameter epsilon and I'm saying it's 1 here. Okay, what do I mean by L? Well, it's something like the distance from one typical point in the typical set to another typical point, something like that. You could argue maybe therefore L should be 10 or 14 or something like that. It's all ballpark numbers. So, here are some questions about this chain. Um, I'll just set it going. Um, you, you can imagine if this lecture set is 20 meters wide, I could um, perform this for you now by tossing the coin and either moving to the right or to the left. And uh, those, those proposed moves, when you use the Metropolis method, will always, in fact, be accepted if I'm in the middle of the lecture theater because the probability ratio between any two adjacent places, P star over P star, is 1. And the Q ratio is always going to be 1 because you've got a 50% chance of coming back from that. But when I actually get to the wall, uh, if we propose uh, moving to the right, then that will be forbidden. And you'll get an accepted probability of 0 in those cases. So there's the first 20 steps on the screen uh, of this chain starting from the middle. I started off at, at an arbitrary place. Um, X is 10, I think, is where I started it. And you can see it went left, right, left, right, 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 left, right, right, And that's 20 iterations. So here are some questions for you to discuss. Question one. Roughly, how long will it take until this chain generates a good sample from P? Until this chain generates a good sample from P. And I haven't really defined who's good, but I just like you to turn to your neighbor and um, answer the question anyway, because this is the real world. And people don't define things completely precisely. So how long is it going to have to run for? And if you're struggling with that question, here's another question which is perhaps more precise. How long do you think it's going to be, roughly, until we hit a wall, one wall or the other. And question three, how long until we, how long do you think it'll be until we've hit both walls? Okay, questions two and three are precise questions. I'm asking you for a probability distribution and you can compute it if you want. I'd like you to roughly uh, tell me what that the probability distribution is. How long until we hit one wall? How long until we hit two? And then you can have a think about whether those questions are relevant to question one. How long do you need to run the chain for starting from, say, x equals 10 until you think you're getting a good, a good random value out? So, chat to your neighbors. Okay, any thoughts on any of these questions? Yeah. Okay, which question are you answering? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, to get a good sample from P, you're saying it has to have a, a chance of, of getting quite a long way and that's going to be quite a rare thing that it manages to go a long way. So your suggestion was once it's made about 10 unlikely things happen, happen, then maybe we will, will have got there. And so what is half to the 10? That's about one in a thousand, isn't it? So you're saying after about a thousand steps, is that what you're saying? Then you think it might, it might be doing all right because about 10 unlikely things need to happen. Okay, that's an interesting train of thought, and it may well be in the right ballpark. Any other ways of answering any of these questions? Anyone? Yes? Yeah. 
Okay. Okay, so you're saying if we've had long enough to hit a wall, then it's probably long enough for it to be a good sample. All right, so how long is it until we uh, hit a wall? Since you think this is the way to answer the question one. About 100 steps. Why about 100? Grand. So the distance you go, the typical distance you've gone, is something like the square root of the number of time steps for a random walk. So let's confirm that statement. So even though it only takes 10 steps in principle to reach a wall, you'd be, that would be quite unlikely to happen, and you only need 31 steps in principle if you go that way for 10 steps, then this way for uh, 21 steps, you will have visited both walls. Um, so you only need 31 steps, but we're actually expecting to take about 100 steps to get to one wall, and then if you want to get all the way from there to the other wall, maybe roughly maybe another 400, 500 to, to have a chance of getting back. So let's let's go through the reasoning. So let's define the distance that the random walk will have gone. The delta x is a sum of all the steps we make. So after a time capital T, the distance we've gone after a time capital T is a sum of a load of steps, ST. And each of the STs is either plus one or minus one, or it could be zero if we do a rejection and stay where we are. But to start with, we're in the middle of the lecture theater. We're not re doing any rejection. So let's actually neglect the walls to make life easy and just get a rough answer. And then the steps are all either plus or minus one variables. And we're interested in the variance of delta x. So delta x is how far we've gone. We're interested in how wide um, that distribution is. If we look at the variance of delta x, which is the average value of delta x squared, delta x is a sum of independent random variables, and so variance is add. So the variance of delta x is the sum of the variances of the individual steps. And if you take a single step, it's either plus 1 or minus 1, its mean squared value is 1 squared, which is 1. So all of these things are 1, and so the variance of delta x is t. Okay. So, if you want the typical distance you've gone, to be L squared, then you need to run this chain for time L on epsilon squared. I've thrown in an epsilon just to show you how this is scaling in general. In general, in this particular case, epsilon is 1. These steps were of size 1. So when I said what the mean squared step size was, this is T epsilon squared. So for this to equal L squared, you need your T to be L on epsilon squared. All right, so that's a nasty scaling. Uh, it's scaling quadratically with the ratio of the size of your space to the size of the steps you're taking in the space. So the for this example, we're expecting either 100 or 400 or something like that to be the answer to question 2 and question 3. And then the answer to question 1 is maybe... Um, one of those. It's not quite clear um, which. So let's keep running the chain. So after 40 iterations, that's where we're up to. 60 iterations, 80 iterations, and after 100 iterations, uh, we have reached a wall. So in this particular run, 100 was a very good guess. And we keep on going. I keep on bonking against the wall. And whenever we bonked against the wall, we stayed in the current place. We proposed a move to the right, but we weren't allowed to. We keep on going, and that's 200 iterations, 220, 240, 260, 280. We're back, hitting the same wall, 300, 400, 440. Okay, and then we've gone, and we've proposed a move after 480 iterations. So um, it's uh, unreasonably uh, in agreement with, with what you said. 100 to reach the first one, then an extra 400 to reach the other ball. So, uh, th that rule of thumb, back of envelope, 
method has got us uh, what looks like quite a good estimate. And we keep on running, and we come back and we hit that wall again, and again, and again. And then maybe 400 iterations later, we're still over at that wall, and then we have a run of progress to the other side, and after 900, which was another 400 iterations, <laughs> after the 500, we we're back hitting the first wall. Okay. So that's what happens when you run this chain. So it takes thousands of iterations to get good independent points. And one other way of visualizing this is to imagine making a histogram of where we have been during this simulation. So here's the histogram after 40 iterations, after 80, after 120. I'm just stacking it up. So this is for the simulation we just did. So after 400 iterations, uh, 500, we managed to hit both walls, but still our histogram of where we've actually been is quite higgledy-piggledy and uneven. So this is the point at which you might say, I've actually got one decent independent sample from this after about 500 iterations or so. Okay, so that's the histogram. I'm not saying that when you run a metropolis method like this, you should throw away all of the points bar one. You should just be aware when you collect those thousand points that really the effective number of independent samples you've got after running it for 1,200 iterations is probably only one or two, because you've only just gone past um, twice 500. Okay, so that's the random walk problem. And we can analyze this a little bit more. Um, another way of looking at this is to make for ourselves the transition probability matrix, uh, which I've shown here, multiplied by 100. So for the chain that we're running here, it's got 21 possible states, and the transition probabilities, if you're, if you're in a particular state, you read out a column, and it shows you've got a 50-50 chance of either going up one or down one. If you're in the end state, you've got a 50-50 chance of staying where you are or moving down one. Okay, so that's the chain. And we can now, for this fantastically simple problem, we can actually answer question one really quite precisely. We can say, well, for any particular duration, what's the probability distribution of where you will have got to if you start from x equals 10 at time zero? And you can answer that question for any starting position and we can plot the probability distribution of where you will have actually got to. So this is the answer to after zero steps, what's your probability distribution? The answer is, well, you're either in location 10 or you're in location 17, if that was where you started. And I'm going to show in yellow and blue those two distributions. So we're starting out with a probability one of being in state 10 or a probability one of being in state 17. That's my two starting conditions. And then after one step, you, you're either in these 50-50 in these two yellow places, or you're 50-50 in the two blue places, respectively. Are you with me? Any questions? Okay, so after two steps, this is your distribution. After three steps, that's your distribution. And you'll recognize this as one of those 1, 3, 3, 1 things out of the um, out of Pascal's triangle. After four steps, it's this 1, Four six four one, except the blue distribution uh, is one four six four, and then the one has got nudged one step to the left because if you try to go to twenty one, you will have been forbidden and you will have come back one step. So those are both one four six four one, but the right hand one in blue is a little bit squished. All right, that's the next row of Pascal's triangle, except that the right hand side now something a bit skewy is is happening. After six iterations, after seven. Well, up to distributions that look like this. And now I'm going to stop every 25. So that's up to 25 steps. And this very jagged picture in yellow is showing you that if you start from 10, after 25 steps, you're still quite unlikely to have hit a wall at all. And given that you've made an odd number of tosses, you're very likely to be in an odd location. It, uh, there's only a few even places that you have any chance of being in. So after 50 iterations, it hasn't changed much. If you started from 17, you're still very likely to be at the right-hand side. 
if you start in the middle, you're more likely to be in the middle than at, at the edges, and you're very unlikely to be in locations 9 and 11. So on the next step, on when the time is 51, you're quite likely to be in location 9 and 11, and you're very unlikely to be in location 10. So it's still got this memory of odd and even, because it only loses its odd and even memory whenever it bumps into a wall. Okay, 75 iterations, 100 iterations. So if you said you think 100 is enough, you might look at this graph now and actually think again. Because if you run it for 100 iterations, say every time I'll just run it for 100 iterations and stop, and then I'll go back to 10 and run it again from the middle and do another round, and then back to 10 and do another round, and those will all be good samples. Well, actually, they're largely going to be even, aren't they? You're not going to get the right fraction of odd numbers from that. So 100 isn't quite long enough even if you start in the middle at 10. And definitely it's not long enough if you start at 17, because you've got a much lower chance than uniform of being in box zero after 100 steps. Keep going, 125, 150, 175, 200. Okay, it's getting pretty uniform now. So the rough statement that, yeah, you could be pretty much anywhere after 200, or after, what did we say, 400 is where we really uh, we're convinced. It's becoming fairly true now, but there's still some wiggliness there, so we're more likely to be in uh, odd state in yellow, and then a little bit on. Now we're more likely to be in even state, just by a little bit, so it really hasn't forgotten the initial condition yet. So we keep on going. 300 steps, 325, 350, 375, and now once we've gone to 400 steps, you can hardly see on the screen the difference between the, the yellow and the blue. So in that sense, you've almost forgotten your initial condition to a precision of, I don't know, one part in a hundred in these probability distributions. And you keep on going, and the, dis the distance gets smaller and smaller. And after 500 steps, you can scarcely see the difference between those at all. And you can scarcely see the difference between the two of them and the flat distribution, which is the nasty red thing that we're meant to be answering from. Okay? Good. Any questions about this so far? So the general message we've got is, if you make sets of size epsilon, and if the distribution you're dealing with has got a characteristic length scale of L in those same units, a random walk method is going to take at least L on epsilon squared steps uh, to, to get around. It may be worse because there might be other properties. You know, this red distribution might have some nasty canyons in it, places that are difficult to get across then you'll have to run it for even longer. So this number that we've got, C is L on epsilon squared, is just a bound, it's a lower bound on how long you might have to run um, one of these methods for. Everything I've shown you here is in one dimension. Let's just make clear how it relates to higher dimensional problems. In a typical problem, if, say, it's an inference problem that you're working on, and if all of these things called x are unknown parameters that are being determined by data, then in the real world, typically, you have quite a lot of data and you have quite a lot of unknown parameters. And so the nasty red distribution may look more like this. It may be two-dimensional. It may be even a few thousand-dimensional. And it'll have some long length scales and some length scales that are perhaps a bit shorter. So, in general, you might have, this is again a cartoon of the real situation. There might be gamma dimensions, gamma for G or good, which means well-determined dimensions. Gamma dimensions where the length scale is, let's say, L. And then there might be k minus gamma other dimensions in which the length scale is much larger. These would be the poorly determined parameters. This is the total number of parameters, the dimensionality of x is k. k minus gamma dimensions are poorly determined by the data. You haven't uh, pinned them down yet. And gamma are well determined by the data. Now this is your effective number of parameters or your number of degrees of freedom. Uh, number of well-determined parameters. And if you now give yourself a set size, epsilon, 
you could imagine epsilon being as small as L or smaller. So you could use as your step size for your metropolis method something this big, so the tiny little epsilon. Or you could use something this big. Or you could use something this big. So you've got freedom when you're designing your metropolis thing to have epsilon be any size you want. You, you pick that parameter. What's going to happen now? Well, if all your steps are accepted and you just do a random walk, then it's still the case that the typical distance you will have gone after t steps is growing as the square root of t. And it's going to take you at least L on epsilon squared steps to get around from one independent point in the distribution to another effectively independent point. So you need at least L on epsilon squared steps to get a fresh independent point, a fresh independent sample. So that pushes you to say, well, I want epsilon to be really big then, so that L on epsilon is as small as possible. So this fact here, which is true, is saying, ah, let's make epsilon as big as we can. However, if you make epsilon really big, and make it as big as L, for example, um, big L, then what's going to actually happen? Well, if you are in the typical set, and you make a proposal from this big green sphere here, which, remember, is gamma dimensional, effectively. The whole space is k-dimensional. And gamma of those dimensions take us off this pancake. There's a thin pancake with a width of only little l. And in, so many of those dimensions will be falling off the pancake. What that means is the probability of making an acceptable move if epsilon is big is going to be the ratio of this volume to this volume. And that's bad news. Let's just think about that. If you use an epsilon that's significantly bigger than little l, the little length scale, then the probability of making an accepted move is tiny. It's in all of the long dimensions, you don't need to worry. You're very unlikely to fall off the pancake. But in the short dimensions, the, the chance of staying on the pancake is, is tiny. It's going to be the volume of the pancake in, a, in, the, in the subspace perpendicular to the pancake. You've got that length raised to the power gamma, which is the number of dimensions that go off the pancake. And then you divide that by the volume of the sphere that you're drawing from. So this is the probability of making an accepted move. And that is the ratio of L at the little length over your step size epsilon raised to possibly quite a big number gamma, the number of well-determined parameters, which could easily be thousands. This is a disaster if you make epsilon big in fact, if you make it bigger than little l at all. So essentially, there's a constraint that you can't go here. Epsilon greater than l is bad news. Because even though you wanted to, in order to reduce your, your random walk properties, you wanted to go here, you'll actually end up with a, a chain that just sit still and make proposals proposals, and all of those are rejected except for a very, very small chance of finally making a proposal that makes a nice big hop and takes you somewhere acceptable. But it would happen so rarely that you don't actually want to be here. So in practice, the feasible, sort of sensible values of epsilon are hereabouts. And obviously, you don't want to make it unnecessarily small, so actually, this is where you want to be. You want to somehow know what the smallest length scale of your distribution is, and then that's roughly 
what you want your step size epsilon to be. If you're using a metropolis method with some sim simple proposal distribution like a spherical gas. So in practice, people using those sort of metropolis methods will then find that their optimal epsilon is roughly the smallest length scale. And when they run their metropolis method with that smallest length scale as their step size, then they will find that they're accepting roughly 50% of the proposal. So the um, resulting optimal acceptance probability is roughly a half, possibly a little bit bigger than a half, but not a million miles from a half. Okay. So I've spent ages talking about random walks. And now what we want to do is reveal some ways of getting rid of these random walk problems. What we've shown here is we've got two issues. One is that we have random walk behavior. We would like cunning methods that don't get around by random walk, that, that persist instead, that persist in going in a particular direction in some way such that you're still asymptotically drawing, right, drawing from the right distribution, but you keep going on a short time scale in a, in a consistent direction. So that's goal number one. And goal number two is it's a pain in the neck to have to carefully tune these step sizes. If you don't know what the shortest length scale of your problem is, it will really pay you off for you to find that out. Because if you use a step size that's too big, you'll actually be running a simulation that will do nothing a lot of the time. And if you make it too small, you're wasting time quadratically badly. So it would be brilliant to have methods that didn't require this special, sensitive, careful tuning. It would, it would be nice to have a robust method that is self-tuning, that automatically chooses the right step size in a way that is valid, not using any sort of hack. So let's now address both of those ideas. So we have zipped through all of these pictures here, and we're now talking about efficient Monte Carlo methods. And the first efficient method we'll talk about is called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is something you can do if you've got yourself a Monte Carlo method which is like the Metropolis method we were just discussing. So it's in a continuous state space and it's one where you're perhaps used to making small proposals of small moves using, say, a Gaussian distribution. For problems of that type, you may be able to use the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo method. This is how it works. Let's um, find the relevant demo. Okay, so I'll show you first a problem. Here's the problem. It's actually a Gaussian distribution. So we know all about Gaussians, and I'm going to pretend that we don't know how to, how to sample from it. So I'm attempting to sample from the nasty reddish-orange Gaussian distribution, which is a highly correlated Gaussian distribution in two dimensions. And I've started from an initial condition that doesn't lie in the typical set, and I'm using the Metropolis method, making little spherical green proposals, uh, spherical uh, proposals centered on the current point. And off we go and go step, 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 and each time we propose a new place in blue and we either accept or reject. And almost all of these proposals have been um, uh, accepted, at least the ones you're seeing how. I guess there were an equal number that proposed going uphill away from the physical set, and those got rejected, and I didn't have to show those on screen. So you, you can't see uh, the rejection. So that was after, I don't know, 20 or so steps, and we run it for another 20 or so steps, and that's where we've got to. Run it for another 20 or so steps, and we've got there, another 20 or so, and we're there, another 20 or so, and we're there, which is sort of where we were a moment ago. So now we're spending lots of computer time making little steps and not getting very far. Oh, we had a little run of progress there, maybe, uh, and now we sit still <laughs> again. 
or what paint dry. Okay, so that's an example world. Now, let me describe to you how the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo method works. Hamiltonian Monte Carlo has got two names, actually. It's either called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, or in the old days, it used to be called hybrid Monte Carlo, for uh, that I won't go into. So the modern name for it is Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. But if you see people talking about hybrid Monte Carlo, it's exactly the same thing. Here's the cheeky way that this works. We're imagining that we've got a nasty distribution that we are finding very difficult to draw samples from. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this difficult high dimensional problem and we're going to say, all right, let's make the dimensionality twice as big. And let's define a new distribution over x and a new thing called p, which is going to be called the momentum. So we'll make the problem twice as big in dimensionality, and we'll define the joint distribution of x and p to be the original nasty distribution we first thought of on x multiplied by a simple distribution, e to the minus half p squared on m for the momentum variable appropriately normalized, call it z for the momentum. So we make the problem space twice as big. So, and we say, OK, you find it difficult to sample from this distribution. Why don't you try and solve this problem instead? It's twice as big, and it's not obvious why this should help at all. Well, the neat thing we've now done is you can think of this probability distribution as being e to the minus an energy function, which you can think of as a potential energy in x space. Plus, we've got a kinetic energy term, half p squared on m. All normalized. And this right-hand side here is sort of familiar if you're thinking of your system as a physical system with a potential energy and a kinetic energy. And we know all about such systems. We know Newton's laws. And Newton's laws are a way of getting around on a total energy function like this in a way that conserves energy. So here's the trick. We define an augmented problem that's twice as big. That opens up to us a whole load of new moves we can do. We can move around on surfaces of constant total energy by using Newton's laws. What does the real world do in order to sample from nasty distributions like this? Well, it uses Newton's laws, and maybe it if, if, if we're trying to simulate it at a particular temperature, we have some sort of interaction with a heat vat. And because these momentum variables have a very simple distribution, we know how to redraw them from a distribution corresponding to a heat vat distribution. So every now and then, we can have the momentum variables interact with a heat vat. So that's like what the real world does. The real world uses Newton's laws to make x move around. And Newton's laws say uh, that x dot is basically something to do with your momentum. So you go in the direction of your momentum. And p dot is something to do with the force. So your p dot is the derivative of the energy with respect to x. I won't bother putting in exact minus signs. So this is Newton's law. You keep going in the direction of your velocity. And uh, this is f equals ma, effectively. You look at the force, which is the derivative of the energy with respect to your uh, state space variables. And you make the momentum change in that direction. You accelerate in the direction of the force. All right. In detail, what Hamiltonian Monte Carlo does is more complicated than what I just said, because you actually need a practical computer algorithm to simulate Newton's laws. But the rough idea is this. One, simulate Newton's laws. And we'll admit that we're actually doing that approximately, but we're going to fix up the approximateness. By a clever accept or reject rule that checks on what's happened to the change 
and energy. The change in the total energy of your little simulation. And step three is randomize the momentum t by drawing it from the correct distribution e to the minus half c squared on m and you repeat so the rough idea is Newton's laws randomize momentum Newton's laws randomize momentum and you run Newton's laws for a time and that can be an arbitrary time and that's one of the tunable parameters you will still have to adjust. Your simulation will involve little set sizes because you have to actually do, I don't know, a uh, leapfrog method or something like that. And you have to choose little sets of time. So it still has parameters which are going to be changed in the next. But during the Newton's Laws bits, you're going to be moving a long way. And I'll show you that for this toy problem. To make this whole thing work, we accept or reject every one of those Newton's Law simulations. And it's based on the change in energy. If the energy goes up during a simulation, you say, well, well, that shouldn't really have happened. The total energy should have stayed constant. Maybe I'll reject. And you flip a coin to determine whether you reject. If the energy goes down, you say, well, that shouldn't have happened either, but I'll accept it anyway, because that's the way it actually works. All the details are in the, uh, the book. So let's go ahead and show you that happening. And so we're going to start from the same start point. Um, and I can do this a few times so you get the, to see the flavor of this. So, here's what we did. We started from the same start point shown by the white arrow, and I used Newton's laws with a, quite a large time step, so that when we started from this place, miles from the typical step, remember this is a quadratic basin here that we're dealing with, so it's got very, very steep when we're at the place shown by the white arrow. So there's a massive force taking us downhill and we go whoosh right the way across the valley and out the far side on the first, first step. And then the momentum's turning around. It's saying, no, 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 go back the other way. And after the second step, we turn around our momentum. We're going back. Bong, 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 bong. And we go to the yellow place after, what is it, sort of uh, 10, 10 or so of these little steps of Newtonian simulation. And we say, OK, check what's happened to the energy. And the answer is, well, it went down and up and down and up. Well, sorry, the total energy hasn't changed. The potential energy has gone way up and down. The kinetic energy has gone way up and down. The total energy hasn't changed very much. And we accept this move. And so we've gone all the way from the white arrow to the yellow thing, which you might think isn't much progress. But at least you could see there was some persistence. We sort of kept on going and we actually went so far that we turned around and came back. So we persisted um, in lots of different directions. OK. It got accepted. And we run again. And now we've gone zoosh, and we've gone way over there. So we've easily gone much further than the total length scale of this problem if you integrate up our pedometer. So we're making these huge long hops, and we happen to have gone downhill just a little bit as well. Um, do another run. Uh, remember when we randomize the momentum, if it just happens to be the case that we've gone downhill at the end of one of these things, or at a lower place than where we started, We'll still have the same total energy, but because we've gone downhill, we'll have a massive momentum. And when you do step three that says randomize the momentum, that means your momentum will get calmed down. You'll, you'll suddenly lose a load of the energy because you draw from the correct distribution instead of this massive high speed, uh, speed, this high speed you've got. You chuck that away and say, hey, give me a fresh speed uh, of order one. So let's watch that happen. Okay, you see now we're not going so fast. And we end up at a lower place, uh, and we accept. And from there, we randomize T again, and off we go, and we're there. We randomize T again, we go there, we randomize T again. Oh, and now, look what's going to happen. We happen to be in, um, this is showing a contour of energy equal to one or two, or something like that. So this really shows the typical set is where we ought to be. So will we ever hop outside, uh, significantly outside the orange contour again? Well, hopefully not for a while. So we randomize momentum, and now we're there. And we haven't gone very far, have we? What, what did I say? Didn't I say we were going to persist? Well, let's try again. We just happened to go a very short distance. Randomize the momentum. Off we go. And we're going quite a long way. Randomize it again. We don't go very far. Randomize again. Very far. And then, whoosh! Where did we go? Right at the far side. So sometimes, when the momentum just happens to be pointing the right way, 
we do these massive long moves that take us right the way along the typical set. Okay, randomize momentum again. We do some jiggling around up at that uh, corner. Randomize again. Oh, we've gone a little bit further up the valley. And um, now we come back again. And randomize again. Randomize again. So see how we're making much faster progress around than the standard Metropolis method. Just to ram that home, let's go back to Metropolis method and start from the place in the typical set. So, whoops, wrong one. Okay, so we start in the typical set and now we're using the Metropolis method. And every one of these little new blue boxes is created by proposing a random little change and then we evaluate the new energy in that location. The amount of computer time it takes to make a little step and find the energy in that new location is about the same as the amount of work it takes if you're using Newton's laws and you make a single little step of simulating this sort of thing, a little change in position in proportion to the velocity, and then a little bit of responding to the force. Because computing the force takes the same amount of computer time as working out the energy. All right? So I'm being fair here. Each of these little blue squares in the Metropolis method takes the same amount of computer time as one of the little squares in the uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So, so each of these squishes that we're making is taking the same amount of computer time, and it will take L over epsilon squared time to actually get from end to end of this distribution. If we go back and start from exactly the same place with Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, not there, not there, here, from here, okay, then with the same amount of computer time as those, what was it, 20 or so little blue steps that we were doing before, we get all the way to the yellow place. And then we same amount of computer time again, we've got all the way back. And right again, we've gone right to the far end of the distribution. So I hope this makes clear. I'm not, not cheating. It really is the case. Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, if it's been appropriately tuned, can massively reduce your random walk behavior. But it has a whole load of extra parameters you have to faff around with, so we may not be completely in love with it. Now, let's uh, move on to another concept called over-relaxation. The idea of over-relaxation is that it can be applied to Gibbs sampling problems. Gibbs sampling, remember, doesn't have any um, tunable parameters. You just draw from the conditional distribution of each variable one at a time. And it doesn't have any obvious way of including momentum in it. So how can we get persistence to happen? Well, the idea that a chap called Adler came up with is called over-relaxation. So, whereas in standard Gibbs sampling, you work out the conditional distribution of the variable. You work out the conditional distribution of one of the variables, condition, conditional on all the others. So standard Gibbs sampling with an ASCII distribution that looks like this. It takes a slice and says, what is the conditional distribution of one variable conditioned on the others, and wherever you are at the moment, you just make a fresh draw from that distribution. The idea of over-relaxation is, if your current position is actually here, so you're at this point, then in some cunning way, you deliberately draw not from the correct conditional distribution, but from a distribution that's somehow biased to the opposite side of the mode. The details are in the book, and there's two ways of doing this. One is, if the conditional distribution that you're talking about is a Gaussian, you draw from a Gaussian that is squished and on the far side of the real Gaussian. So there's a, 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 a simple squishy rule that says, squish it down and flip it to the opposite side. And you can prove that asymptotically you'll end up doing the right thing. So Adler's method, which I'll show you now, is a very simple method for the case where all the conditional distributions are Gaussians.
And you might say, well, how can it possibly be interesting if all your conditional distributions are Gaussian? Doesn't that mean that the distribution you're working with is a very simple distribution? Well, no, not necessarily. There do exist interesting distributions, all of whose conditional distributions are Gaussian, yet the joint distribution is uh, very difficult to sample from. So this is an interesting capability to have. So let me show you Adler's method on the Gaussian distribution. So we've done Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And this is what Gibbs sampling looks like for the same problem. So it's exactly the same Gaussian we were just playing with, with Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. If you use Gibbs sampling, there's no parameters at all, but the typical steps you take when you draw from the conditional distribution this way or the conditional distribution this way, because those two directions are the axes, the typical steps will always be of a width similar to the width, the thin width of the green distribution. So you're never going to be taking steps of size big L, they're always going to be steps of size little L, which is, which means that you've got a random walk problem. It's going to take you big L on little L squared time to get an independent sample using Gibbs sampling. So Adler's method says instead that we draw deliberately from the opposite side of the distribution in one way, and then we go to the other variable and we draw from the opposite side of its distribution. The net result is shown here in red. So you can see we roughly run along the contour with a little bit of wobble up and down the contour. If we zoom in on this, I'll show you the individual steps. So what this is showing to you, I forget which way time went, it's all reversible anyway. Let's imagine that we started from the bottom left here. We started a little bit above the green contour at the very bottom left, and then we flipped across to the opposite side, still a little bit above the green contour. And then we flipped the opposite side again above. So flip across, across and across and across. And that means we persistently go. And if you look at every other position, that's what the red line is showing you. You wander along the contour in this two-dimensional problem. And you can do this in higher dimensions. And for many problems, it turns out that the, the Adler method does reduce your random walk behavior. And there are various ways of revealing the uh, improvement in performance. And one is to invent some simple statistics to keep track of and look at the fluctuations in those statistics. And if, they, if the autocorrelation time is very short for a statistic, then that's an indication that, that the method is a good fast method, that it's mixing quickly. So here's a quantity, x1, the two, two variables are called x1 and x2. So here's x1 wandering around under a regular old Gibbs sampling, shown in, and that's in orange. Then in red, here's the over-relaxation version of x1, and you can just eyeball those and you can say, yeah, x1 is definitely moving around um, faster under uh, the Adler method. And another quantity you can look at is x1 squared. And under Gibbs sampling, it takes ages to get around from being in the middle to being at one of the extremes. In contrast to the Adler method, x1 squared is going up and down much faster. So that's a crude indication that, at least on this toy problem, the Adler method is better for those statistics at least. So that's over relaxation for conditional distributions that are Gaussians. And you might say, well, that's not going to help me because my problem doesn't involve any conditional distributions that are Gaussian. I'm far more interesting than that. And there's good news for you. Even if you are an interesting person, you can still do over-relaxation using another method. And it's called ordered over-relaxation. And ordered over-relaxation was invented by Radford Neal. And it works like this. Imagine that you are doing Gibbs sampling and you have got a method which will draw you a new point from this conditional distribution here. So you're at a current point here and you have got the capability, because you're doing Gibbs sampling, to draw one new point from this conditional distribution. Well, you now draw k times from that distribution. So you draw k times, and that gives you a whole bunch of points that might look like this. 
All right. Let's make it a tiny bit more interesting. Let's put another couple there. Right, what have I shown? I've shown the case K is seven. So I've drawn seven green points. And the total set of points we have here is a set of eight points, including the one that we're currently at. And the ordered over method says, okay, now count across. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You're at the third point. Please go to the third one from the other end. So you go to the sixth point in this case. Wherever you are, you go to the point that's the opposite one in the screen. All right? And that means if you're way over on the left-hand side, if you were, if the white dot was actually number one in the list, you would have gone to the far side. So this is something that can be done for any real value variable. And it's provably uh, correct and valid, and in practice, a good value of k uh, might be something like 20 or so. And the additional work to get 20 draws from this distribution uh, is quite often not much extra work at all. For example, if you have to use adaptive rejection sampling, if you, if you were using a rejection sampling method to draw uh, the first of these points in green, Often, adaptive rejection sampling has the property that you can get another k minus one point at almost no cost at all. All of the work was consumed in getting the first point, then the other ones are free. So this can be a very, very cheap method, and it may well uh, improve your random walk behavior. There's no uh, absolute guarantee, but it's, it's definitely worth trying. And there's a piece of software out there called Bugs, which means Bayes get inference using Gibbs sampling. And Bugs has been around for about 15 or 20 years now. And it's a way of implementing Gibbs sampling for a whole feast of different models. You, you specify the model using a simple declarative language, and then it figures out how to run the Gibbs sampling for you. And I'm pretty sure that the versions of Bugs that are out there now have all got ordered, error, ordered over elastation built into them, so you can get this um, speed up for free, or you can at least test it out and see if it does give you the speed up using bugs. Okay. We've been going for an hour. Um, shall we just carry on with the uh, advanced methods show? Does anyone need a break? Okay, let's keep going. So I've shown you over relaxation, and now I'd like to move on to this question of dependence on parameters. So, the vanilla metropolis method we were talking about used a Gaussian distribution with some width, and the width of that distribution was crucially important. We wanted it to be as big as possible and no bigger. When we use Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, there are similar step size parameters. Gibbs sampling doesn't have any parameters, which means that maybe we like it. But Gibbs sampling only works if you've got a problem where you know how to draw from the conditional distribution here. And it may be that you're in a world where you just haven't got a clue how to do that. Your energy function is just too complicated. You can evaluate it, but you can't draw from the conditional distribution. It would be nice to have a method that automatically discovers for itself the right step size. And that's what slice sampling does. So, we will now discuss slice sampling. Slice sampling was invented by two people. Namely, Radford Neal and John Skilling. And it's a very elegant um, amazingly simple looking way of solving the problem. It looks so simple you could imagine a, a, a school child inventing it actually and you might say oh it's too simple it can't possibly work. Um, so let me show you slice sampling and I'll do it first for this good old red one-dimensional distribution. The idea of slice sampling 
is you can do it in many dimensions by doing one dimension at a time, just like Gibbs sampling. So it's a method a bit like Gibbs sampling. You pick a single dimension to work in, or a single direction. It can be any direction you want in your in your continuous state space. And you use the method that I'm going to describe in that one dimension, and then repeat in other dimensions. So here's how it goes. We have a nasty red distribution, and we have a current location, which we'll call xt. And I'm now going to describe to you how we get to the next location, which we'll call xt plus 1. And it's going to be quite a few steps, so don't hold your breath. First, at the current location xt, we evaluate p star. So this is a graph of p star, and we evaluate p star there. Then we draw a point uniformly between 0 and p star of x. And we can think of that as picking a point on this telegraph pole. Then we create a horizontal object of width w, where w is going to be a set size parameter of the slice sampling method, whose value we don't care about very much, because the whole thing is going to be robust to it. So this is a, our guess of what a good step size might be. We make a little object like this. And this little green thing, its height is determined by the height of the white dot, and its offset is chosen randomly, uniformly, from all possible offsets from um, the two little um, ends of this green pole are either aligned with the white dot this way or that way and you pick uniformly from all of those possibilities. Okay? So we pick a uniform choice of this little horizontal strut going off the telegraph pole. Alright, that was step two. Step three is you check to see at those two places what's the value of P star there and what's the value of P star there. And if this value of P star is above the green line, which it is, you say, oh, whoops, that's not far enough. Let's make an additional step of size W. And then check. And you keep on stepping out until when you check at that place, are we above P star? And the answer here was already yes, we're above, so we stopped stepping out in this direction. And in this direction, we had to step out once, and then we got a tick. Yes, we're above, and so we stopped. And by that process, we've now created a wider green object. So this is called the stepping out phase. Then, the next thing we do is we draw uniformly from the green line that we've just created. So you pick any point at all on the green line which could be, for example, here. And this is our candidate that we're possibly going to end up calling xt plus 1, but we do have to check one more thing. Namely, if you look there, does that point lie above the red curve? And if it doesn't, we're okay. If it does lie above the red curve, we say, whoops, that's no good, sorry. And in this case, it does lie above the red curve, so we say, sorry, that's no good. And to make things run a bit faster, you can optionally wipe out all of the green stuff that lies beyond this rejected point, away from it, in the sense of away from the white dot that we started from. Okay? So we proposed a point on the green line. We drew one that was above the red, curve, and we rejected it, and now we say, okay, try again. Keep drawing from this same green line until you get one that lies below. And maybe, improbably, you might get this over here, in which case now you say, no, that's rejected because it's lying above the red curve too. Notice we're having to do lots of evaluations of P star in this method. And so we chuck away this little bit of green here. And notice now this green thing is really quite a snug fit around the red curve. So next time we draw, it's going to be very unlikely that we're going to miss this time. So we draw once more, and we draw, say, here, and that 
lies below the red curve. Yep, just that up here. And we say, hooray, you're accepted. And we have now moved from there to there. And we're done. That's one iteration. And then you wipe everything that you, you've done here, except you do keep track of this value of p star, because that's going to be useful for you. And you repeat the process. Okay, let's do it on the computer. Light sound, please. So, we're at a location, and we draw a vertical point, and I've shown it in yellow. We create a green thing of width uh, W. It, ha it looks as if it's centered on the yellow thing, but that's just coincidence. It, it, it was picked at random. Now we check, are the green endpoints outside, above the, the red curve? They're not, so we step out. So the one on the left steps out once, and it's done. The one on the right has to step out twice. Now you draw in blue a new point from the green line. And that is underneath the red curve. And so we accept it and we're done. Press start. Draw a point uniformly on the purple line. There it is. Make a thing of width W. Step out. Draw from it. And that lies below the red curve. So we're done. Notice how each time when we're done, for this problem, which has a P that's a vaguely sort of convex bump, we're moving right the way from one side to the other side of the distribution. Let's draw from this purple line. Now we've drawn something high up, because this is a place where P is big, so it's possible for the green strut to be high up. Now we're not going to go so far, are we? Because we step out, and when we draw from the green thing, we can't go right over into the right-hand side uh, at all. Those are going to be rejected. That got accepted. So notice how we automatically sort of stayed in the place with the narrow peak because it stepped out a shorter distance. And now we've got a low one. We'll possibly go quite a long way. There's another low one. We'll go quite a long way. Oh, that was our first rejection. We made a blue point that was above the red line. So we say no to that. We say try again. So we try there. Oh, and that gets rejected. Try again. And that gets accepted. Okay, so that was five steps of slice sampling. Now I'll let it run for a hundred iterations or so, and you can see it doing its thing. Okay, that was 25 samples. And you can associate each of the acceptances with a point underneath the curve. And the way you prove the theorem that says slice sampling does the right thing is you prove that it leaves this distribution under the curve invariant. So that's the proof technique. So that was slice sampling for the nasty distribution in red, and I think it looks more exciting and it's more incredible that it really works if we do it for a more uh, awkward looking distribution that might look like this. Okay, so there in red is an exciting distribution. And let's do slice sampling on it. Right, off we go. So there's our yellow thing. We step out. Now, are we done? Do we need to step out further? Uh, on the left, clearly yes, because um, we're still under the red curve. On the right, not clear. Uh, okay, we did. That green point was just below the red. So we stepped out like that. Now when we draw a point on the green line, there's only a fairly small chance it will be accepted, isn't there? There's lots of places that are above the red. So that, for example, is above the red line. So we reject it and we say, no, nope, can't go there and we shrink in towards the yellow point. Now we make another draw from the green line, and that gets accepted. So we stayed at home in that one peak. Now we do the vertical thing, make a cross strut, step out, draw a blue point, notice we've hopped from one peak to another. And we could have done that no matter how low the valley is. So this is a method that can make lucky leaps across very, very um, nasty, valleys in P, or you know, in terms of energy landscape, very big hills could have been in the way, and yet we can tunnel across them. Okay, so we've gone from one peak to another. And now, ooh, look where that yellow point came. It's really, really low. That was quite an unusually low point. So now when we do the stepping out thing, we're going to get a very broad green thing. When we draw from that, we move to the right. Yellow point. Step out some more, please, on the left. Thank you. Draw a blue point. Okay, now we've hopped back. So we're hopping between these different peaks. And we keep going. And that's our first five points. And if we run it for longer, 
you can see how it's visiting all of the peaks. Well, not quite all of them yet. Um, so that's life sampling. And it's a pretty cool idea. And Radford Neal and Sampling have both published free software that implements this, this method. And it's very, very general. All you need is the ability to evaluate the red function where you are. A really nice thing to notice about slice sampling is it never ends up rejecting the overall proposal. It, it works and works and works and works and works, and in the end, you've got somewhere, and that somewhere will be different from where you started from. So in contrast to standard metropolis methods where you might do a huge amount of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo simulation dynamics, and momentum, blah, 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 and then it says reject, and you just throw it all away, and you haven't made any progress at all. Here, you always will move possibly a very small distance, but that may be the right thing to do because maybe you're dealing with a very small uh, typical set. So it never rejects. And another beauty of uh, slice sampling is this step size w is not a crucial parameter. Uh, if your w is accidentally 10 times as big as it needs to be, well, it doesn't matter. It only takes a very small number of blue points to shrink down through that shrinkage process to the correct width. Uh, and if your W is too small, it only takes a small number of these stepping out operations, which proceed linearly from your overly small green thing. Uh, only a small number of step outs will be required to encompass the width of the red distribution. So W isn't crucial. It's still a good idea to tune it, but you don't have a catastrophic failure if you get your W too small or too large. And slice sampling does have the property that typically you will make a step that is as big as the width of the peak that you're dealing with. So it, it is the, the final step is of uh, roughly the optimal size. OK. That's slice sampling. And now what I'd like to finish with today is talking about exact sampling. So how long do you need to run a Monte Carlo method for? I'm going to tell you uh, what feels to me like really quite an amazing breakthrough of the, the Monte Carlo community. For decades, the answer to this question, how long do I need to run it for, was, oh, well, how long is a piece of string? You don't really know. You just, you know, you get a bit of feel. You make some diagnostics, blah, blah, blah. So you get a sort of blancmange answer to the question, how long should I run it for? And you always felt dissatisfied. Well, there was a breakthrough, and it happened in approximately 1996 with the invention of methods that are called, I call them exact sampling. They're also known as perfect sampling. And there's a whole family of different uh, perfect sampling methods. And I'm going to describe to you uh, the easiest one to explain. There's probably uh, many uh, tens of papers on this topic now, maybe even hundreds. So how long should we run the simulation for? Well. Exact sampling is based on the idea that you should run it for an infinitely long time, because then you're fine. So how long? Infinitely long is the answer. And you might say, OK, that sounds like a lot of computer time. But here's, here's the beauty of it. You can establish the outcome of an infinitely long computer simulation with a finite amount of computer time. And we're going to run the simulation from the past, from infinitely long in the past, up to the present. So how does that help? Well, let me explain. Let's imagine that this is the state space of your simulation. And for simplicity and for concreteness, let's imagine we're talking about the lecturer flipping the coin to determine whether he goes right or left in the lecture theater that is 20 paces wide. So the state space goes like this. And now what I'm asking you to imagine is that an infinite time ago, a little army of 21 lecturers all started off at time minus infinity in the 21 different locations. And every one of them then started 
running the Monte Carlo simulation of the Metropolis algorithm. So imagine that that happened. And imagine that they used the same random numbers. So the random numbers for all of them are shown here. And the first one was heads, tails, heads, 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 tails, 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 heads, heads, and so forth. And for any time, we imagine we can consult a little encyclopedia of outcomes, and we can say at time minus 1732, what was it? And the answer might be hex. And we can move to the right and say tail, head, head, tail. And whenever you come back to this encyclopedia and say, tell, tell me again, what was the outcome at minus 1732? It will tell you hex. All right? So all of them are going along. And so here's one of them. And if you now say, is there any way I can figure out where one of these is at this time without actually having to start at time minus infinity? Could you do that? Well, maybe you could. Because let's say you don't know where any of them got to at time minus 1732, except that you do know that they must have been either in this state, or this state, or this state, or this state. So there's actually 21 possible states they could have been in at this time. And if you, now, without knowing which of those is true, if you run all 21 of them forward in time and say, well, let's just see now what would have happened for each of those 21 hypotheses. And so you can try all 21 of them and run them forward just from this time up to the present. And if all of these end up sort of going bonk, 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 and colliding with walls and that sort of thing, in such a way that all 21 end up here, then it must be the case that all 21 of these guys have ended up here, even though you don't know where they were at this point. So this is the trick. The trick is some Markov chain Monte Carlo simulations have the property that they do coalesce in time. So if you take all of the state space at time minus 1732 and run it forward, maybe you'll find that all gazillion, or 21, however many there are, of these states will have coalesced into a single state, which then proves that if you had actually run this for an infinite time, you would have come somewhere here, it doesn't matter where, and you would have ended up in this point, which, therefore, is where you would have got to by running this thing in a really long time. So what's the exact sampling method? The exact sampling method says, pick a time into the past, whatever, 100 steps back, 500 steps back, pick whatever you want. It doesn't matter. So we go back 100 steps. Now, simulate forward in time every single initial condition that you could have been at 100 time steps ago. Or if you can get away with it, simulate fewer than that, because maybe you don't need to simulate all of them. Simulate them all forward in time, and if they reach different points, note that they're all using the same random coin clips as each other. So here's the random numbers. So they're all using the same random numbers. That means that if two of them do get into the same state as each other at some point, they will remain in lockstep thereafter. If what you find at time zero is that they are in several states, you say, okay, bummer, uh, but we're not done yet. We go back further, maybe 200 into the past, and repeat the operation and see if these guys, by the time we go forward, have coalesced. And if they haven't, you go back further in time, maybe to 400, and you keep on going back until they have all coalesced, and then you follow them along, and you see where they all ended, and then you can declare that this state is where you would have got to if you'd run it for an infinite time. So that's the method, and it's very expensive in general because you have to simulate 21 initial conditions, or in general sort of 2 to the n, where n is a big number, but if you're really, really, really cunning, you can establish that they have all coalesced 
without actually simulating all of them. And for the special case of the 21 lecturers, you actually only need to simulate the rightmost lecturer and the leftmost lecturer. And you see if those end up sitting on top of each other. And if they are sitting on top of each other, then all the intermediate lecturers must have coalesced with the two of them as well. And that's the general idea of most exact sampling methods. So you have some way of ordering the state space, and then you have the highest state and the lowest state. And you simulate the two of them forward, and then if they have coalesced, then at time zero, you've got yourself a perfect sample. And if they haven't, you just go back further using exactly the same random numbers, and you take the highest state and the lowest state and simulate them forward. And you have to do very careful proofs to prove that this is valid. I'm going to show you some, some beautiful examples of this now. So the first example is to draw a random tiling of a hexagon. So here's a hexagon, and it's been tiled with red, blue, and green lozenges. The lozenges can have three orientations, and they're shown by the three different colors. And you can think of this also not only as a tiling of a hexagon with those lozenges, you can also think of it as filling a brickyard with cubical bricks. And the task is, please give me a random tiling of the hexagon, a perfectly random tiling of the hexagon. Um, and so you invent a Markov chain, which you can think of as adding and removing bricks from the brickyard. And you say, oh dear, how long do I need to add and remove bricks from the brickyard? And the answer is going to be, well, we'll do it for infinitely long, but we only need to simulate a finite amount of time to establish that the completely full brickyard and the completely empty brickyard would both have ended up in the same state. Let's do it. So on the left, we have the empty brickyard, and on the right, we have the full brickyard. And they're simulated forward in time, and it didn't work out. So we go back from 128 sets to 256 sets in the past. We run it forward, and they've coalesced. And so we keep going, and there is a perfect tiling of the hexagon. And so that's how long it took. It took in this case, it took us 256 units of computer time to get the answer. Um, and we go do it again. 128 steps. Hasn't coalesced. Go back to, to 256. So this is using a different, fresh set of random numbers that are defined all the way into the past. Has it coalesced? Hasn't coalesced? Yes. Just at the last moment it coalesced. Do it again. 128 steps. Has it coalesced? No. So we go back to 256 steps into the past. And it's coalesced now. And it keeps on, you keep on going. NB, nota bene. You do not give out the answer when they have coalesced. Because coalescence occurs in unusual states, like when two lecturers are both right next to each other at the left hand side and they, you know, the coin says go left. Then, whoo, now we've coalesced. And that happens in very unusual states. So, the answer isn't when the coalescence happens, it's the answer at time zero, which you find by continuing the simulation. All right, do you want to see any more of those? I'll give you one more. Occasionally, it takes more than 250 steps, six steps uh, from the past. And when I said that, that's just for this particular size of hexagon. Um, running this particular algorithm. Okay, it's coalesced. Boom, and there's another tiling for free. And you might say, who cares about tiling? Well, I'm not sure what this is useful for, but these tilings are actually very beautiful things. And through this work on exact sampling of tilings, um, some discoveries were made. So, here is a perfect tiling using those three lozenges of a bigger hexagon. And here is a perfect tiling of an even bigger hexagon. And when you look at that, you might start to say, ooh, is something happening? Is there a perfect circle appearing around the edge? It's frozen. All the tiles are red up to a, a perimeter, and then they're all yellow in that corner. And there's this sort of arctic circle phenomenon of the freezing of the tiles into a particular orientation in the corner. And they conjectured on the basis of this work on randomly generated tiling, hmm, maybe a random tiling of a hexagon has the property for a very large hexagon that it's got a circular edge beyond which it's frozen with very high probability. And they proved that theorem. So this is a theorem that was discovered thanks to exact sampling. 
The final example I want to show you is uh, to do with icing models. The icing model is a favorite toy world of the statistical physicist. And if you went back before 1996 and asked people, oh, goodness me, this very interesting icing model that I've heard about, I hear it can do phase transitions, it's a bit of a model for the melting of ice and that sort of thing, it's got critical phenomena, it does interesting fluctuations when it melts. Um, tell me, I want to simulate it with the Monte Carlo method. How long can I, should I simulate it for? I want to make a really good typical um, sample. Uh, people would have said, the Blavange answer, oh, I don't know, it's, it's hard, it's difficult, you have this phenomenon called critical slowing down, so that near this, this phase transition you have to simulate it for a very long time and no one really knows uh, how long to simulate it for. Um, in 96, this exact sampling community made a breakthrough, and for, for me it's a bit comparable to the breakthrough in superconductivity. When I was an undergraduate in year one, they said, hey, here's superconductivity, look, we've got some liquid helium, and we'll make some things levitate. And then two years later, came back into the same lecture set, and they said, hey, there's been a breakthrough, we've got high temperature superconductors, and they got out liquid nitrogen, and they made things levitate. So there's been this massive transformation in what they could do. And a similar breakthrough uh, has happened with icing models, uh, which means that it's now possible to show a sample of an icing model and to say this is a perfect sample at the critical uh, temperature, the melting temperature of the icing model. So, just to introduce you to icing models, the icing model is a spin system where every spin is either up or down and it's coupled to its immediate neighbor, so it likes to be the same state as its immediate neighbors. But on the other hand, it, it's got a temperature, so it sort of has a tendency to not do the same as its neighbors necessarily. When it's got a very high temperature, they'll all just be random. So what does it look like? Um, here's a standard metropolis method. Um, here it is at low temperature. You can see it's all white uh, with a tiny bit of blue, or it could be all white with a tiny bit of blue, or it could be all white or and all blue. It's trying to make its mind up. It wants to be all white or all blue at low temperatures. At high temperatures, it's just a speckly mess. And at low temperatures, hmm, in intermediate temperatures, you know, speckly, but a bit blobby, a bit blobby. At high temperatures, very, very uh, speckly. And then if you lower the temperature, it's getting all sort of blobby, blobby on lots of length scales, which is an interesting phenomenon that these things have. So, these long clusters. And then below a certain temperature, it all turns into a single color eventually. But when you're using the metropolis method, it's like watching paint dry for it to lose the uh, one of the answers. Oh, I'm going, to, I'm going to be all blue with just a little bit of white. There are other algorithms you can use which are much uh, quicker at flipping between the all blue and the all white states. Um, so this is as if we're in the pre-1996 state uh, and someone's saying, oh, how long do I run it for? I'm at, I'm at the critical temperature. I'm really interested. You know, I, I know the critical temperature is here or wherever it is. I, I want to get a perfect sample, but I don't know how long to run it for. And I want to get a perfect sample for a really big spin system because uh, it's only for really big spin systems that I can measure how big these different length scales are and find the, the clusters and so forth. So that's the challenge. And the exact sampling community came up with a method of solving this. Uh, just a little bit more introduction to the icing model. I mentioned the critical temperature. As you uh, crank, which way does this go? Um, the temperature is uh, going to, it's bigger to the right, so we're cranking up the temperature. And what happens to the energy is the hotter you uh, make it, the more energy it's got. But the fluctuations in energy, the standard deviation of the energy is shown on this second graph, uh, bottom left. And you can see that at a temperature of uh, 2.3 or so, the fluctuations in the energy get really quite big compared with what they are at other temperatures. So there's something wacky going on at a temperature of 2.3. That's the melting from the mainly all blue or all white state into uh, a much more speckly, clustery sort of state. The average magnetization, which is how much it's all blue or all white, the mean squared magnetization is shown in graph C, which is the, the top right-hand one. And at very low temperatures, it's very, very magnetized. It's almost always entirely, nearly entirely blue or nearly entirely white. Then as you get to the critical temperature, suddenly it becomes sort of 50-50 um, and very, very blocky. 
Okay, so that's what icing models look like. Um, and here is a, I forget how big this thing is, um, uh, roughly 800 by 800 pixel icing model at its critical temperature. And I'm going to show you a computer program that will make another of these perfect samples for you right now. So this is a piece of software written by um, uh, Prof and Wilson, who are two of the heroes of exact sampling. And I'm going to start it running now. And here it goes. It's running from the past to the present. And that little diagram top right is showing what's happening to the, the topmost um, state and the bottommost state. And it's done. So it had to go 32 steps back into the past for the particular simulation method it was using. And what we're visualizing here is not the state of the icing model, but the state of a more general um, system called the random cluster model, which is a, a, uh, a set of points with edges that are either present or not present between adjacent uh, points. And we can then take all of those edges and we could show which things are connected to each other and color them different colors, uh, which identifies the clusters by their colors, and then we can randomly take each cluster and either make it black or white, and that gives us a perfect sample from an icing model. So there you are. I've just done it. In, in front of your eyes, I have created a perfect sample from this uh, extremely large icing model, and it doesn't take uh, very long. It's one of the beauties of this, this method. So on the screen here, it won't look necessarily very good on the video, so just for the benefit of people watching on the video, I'm zooming in now in the top top left hand corner uh, so you can see uh, a bit more of what this would look like if you were seeing this at full resolution. The full resolution version is on the website. Okay, in summary, what have we done today? We've talked a lot about random walk behavior and how we would love to get rid of it. I've shown you some efficient methods for reducing random walk behavior. I've shown you some methods for getting rid of the sensitivity to critical set size parameters. And I've shown you a little bit about exact sampling. There are some other issues with Monte Carlo methods. At the last lecture, someone said, how do you find the normalizing constant? And that's a crucial question. We would love to know Z, the normalizing constant, for many of these problems. And there is an enormous literature on very complicated and cunning methods for trying to evaluate Z using Monte Carlo methods. So here's some words from uh, that literature. Thermodynamic integration is a general concept for um, methods that find normalizing constants, reversal jump, Monte Carlo, acceptance ratio method, umbrella sampling, tempered transitions, annealed important sampling, and linked important sampling, all of which were invented by Radford Neal. The reason it's so difficult to get the normalizing constant is visualized with a cartoon here. Imagine that you've got a lake, and the lake has got a depth, and the depth of the lake is called P star. And imagine you've got some capability to move your boat around on the lake and measure how deep the lake is. And you might be trying to draw uniformly distributed plankton samples from the lake. Let's imagine that you have actually solved that, that you've now got the capability to call up a random point in the lake, random in the sense of uniformly chosen from the whole volume of the lake. And you can go to that point and say, okay, give me some plankton from there and tell me how deep the lake is at this point. If you keep on calling on that capability in your complicated lake, complete with canyons and so forth, you will be able to go to randomly chosen points in the volume of water, and you can find out how deep the lake is at those points. Now, just have a think about that capability. You go to all of those points, and you measure how deep the lake is. Does that tell you how much water is in the lake? Does it tell you the volume of the lake? No, because you could be in a lake that's twice as wide and twice as wide in both dimensions. And all of those measurements would look just the same if you just imagine stretching the, the map of the lake in both dimensions. You would get just the same depth measurements as all of those places. So the, the ability to perfectly sample from the volume of the lake doesn't give you any information about the volume itself. And that's why it's so difficult to get Z, because Z is the amount of water in the lake. So you have to use uh, other methods that look at sequences of probability distributions, trying to tie your to a distribution that you understand and who, where you know the volume 
and then you go from that by a sequence of steps to the real distribution of interest. And in that way, uh, with a lot of cunning, you can deduce Z. So, that's all I wanted to say about advanced Monte Carlo. Are there any questions? Yes. Okay, so the question is, is X a one-dimensional variable in slice sampling? And the answer is, the problem that you are solving may be many-dimensional. If you want to solve a many-dimensional problem with slice sampling, then what you would do is you take your current location and you pick a direction to slice in. It could be any, di any direction as long as your method for choosing the direction doesn't depend on the current location. You pick a direction, and then you say, oh, all right, let's define x to be the distance along this direction. And then you operate slice sampling along that line. And so you'll move, and eventually you'll pick a blue point, which is your new point here. And then you pick another direction at random, maybe, like this. And you use slice sampling along there. And you go, evaluate, 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 step out, shrink down, and you get your next point. Yeah. So that's how you would use slice sampling. It's a lot like give sampling, which goes along the axes. This axis, then it's this axis, this and this. But slice sampling, you can use any method to choose the directions. Okay? Yeah? Say again? Okay, so the question is, can you apply exact sampling to continuous valued uh, parameter spaces? And the answer is yes. Uh, you have to be uh, very cunning, but it is possible to solve some continuous problems using exact sampling methods. So the critical thing you need is some way of achieving coalescence. Even though you've got a, an infinite number of possible values of one parameter, you need to have a chain that has the property that sometimes all of those in, that all of the points in this continuum coalesce onto a single particular value. And you can design chains that have that property. And once you've got that coalescence property, then it's possible to, to do exact sampling uh, using coupling from the past. It's not easy. Um, it, there isn't a huge literature saying, oh, yes, we can do Bayesian inference um, with exact sampling. Uh, that, that's not been achieved yet. But it is possible. Anything else? Okay, thanks very much.